William uh, Dudley Paley, familiar with that name. He started the Order of the Silver Shirts, or called the Silver Legion, back in the uh, 30s, which was a pro-Nazi organization. They wore the, wore the swastikas and everything and had branches throughout the United States. Uh, Paley was also wrote really what uh, people considered the uh, first book of ET channeling called Stargust. This was in the 1930s where he claimed I uh, received messages from the planet Sirius and that they aided our development here. So you go from uh, Paley and there's all kinds of connections. It turns out that George Hunt Williamson, who saw something with George Adamski in 1952, they met one of those Nordics called Orthon out in the Mojave Desert. Williamson was associated with uh, Paley. He wrote on a uh, magazine that Paley published. Uh, Williamson as well claimed that he received channeled messages from Sirius. So Sirius comes up time and time again in a lot of these early uh, contactee stories and kind of evolved into the 1970s where Robert Anton Wilson, Philip K. Dick, and all these other folks were claiming contact with the uh, Sirius star system. Uh, Paley was, organization was called the Silver Shirts, which could be equated to uh, Sirius, the Silver Star, which comes up in the writings of Aleister Crowley. Then we can move on to uh, Jack Parsons. You must get down and look. You must get into the, the nooks and crannies of existence. Or, uh, you have to rub elbows with all kinds and types of men before you can finally establish what he is. here at uh, Devil's Gate Dam in uh, in Pasadena, or rather outside Pasadena. I don't know where the hell we are, but we... The uh, locals call it So Pass, or No Pass. No Pass. We're in No Pass. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, we're here at Devil's Gate Dam. It's a spooky place. Lots of uh, lots of connections with uh, ritualistic things happening in the area, as ev evidenced by the uh, plethora of pentagrams, uh, you know, graffiti in the place. Uh, this was also... This was also a uh, favorite haunt of uh, Jack Whiteside Parsons. Uh, he, was a, he was a rocket scientist for JPL. He was one of the guys credited with putting us on the moon. Blew himself up in 1952 under mysterious circumstances. And before that, uh, uh, basically catapulted us into the, uh, the current flying saucer wave, uh, post-1947. He was a devotee of Aleister Crowley. Set up a branch here in Pasadena of the OTO called the Agape Lodge and operated out of his home, which has been dubbed the uh, Parsonage. And as legend has it, we get into the UFOs again. In 1946, they started he and L. Ron Hubbard, of all people. To really know life, you've got to be part of life. Founder of Scientology, which also seems to be a religion based on extraterrestrials, if you dig deep. Out in the Mojave Desert, at one part in this Babylon working, the design of which was to uh, call down a magical child in impregnate the woman who would take part in the uh, ceremony. They Originally, at the beginning, they didn't have somebody to do that. They were hoping she would come along. One of their rituals, once again, supposedly took out, uh, happened in the Mojave Desert, where they called down some type of entities, and people suggested they opened a door or portal that weren't, they weren't able to close. Once again, this was 1946. Um, this so is where we get into legend and myth. I've heard some stories where the, uh, the entities they called down or made contact with were Venusians. It's unclear, but a lot of people have uh, identified ETs. So that was 1946. The following year started the modern era of UFOs with um, Kenneth Arnold sightings, the Roswell crash, all that happened. So some people suggest that, you know, Parsons and Hubbard opened the door and something flew in. Insert, insert the uh, creepy organ music there. Yeah, and speaking of doors, we're right outside, as you can see, the Devil's Gate, uh, which is just an open portal into you know, some sort of 
works associated with the dam, obviously. Uh, but the, the the story is is that it's uh, it's also an opening to to another area, another dimensions, another whatever, what have you. Uh, and and it, it you know you can see from all the graffiti, as, as Bill said, and all the uh, activities around it, people come down here to kind of experience it and see and see what's happening. Uh, perhaps they're doing other things. There might be some people doing some. Uh, uh, kind of mystical workings, but um, right now I can tell you it's a lot cooler than it is over there, so I'm enjoying this space. Maybe it's full of all sorts of negative feelings, but right now it's a lot cooler. So that brings us to Marjorie Cameron. At one point during the Babylon working, according to Parsons' account, uh, he had been in contact with Aleister Crowley. Crowley gave uh, Parsons some direction on how to uh, find the Scarlet Woman to do the Babylon working with. Shortly afterwards, according to Parsons, there was a crack of a uh, bolt of lightning. Marjorie Cam Cameron showed up on his doorstep, disheveled and confused, and he invited her in and they ended up spending the next couple weeks in bed and started a love affair and eventually got married. The different, there's different accounts. Marjorie Cameron didn't remember it exactly like that, but she did note in later writings that the night she met uh, Parsons at the Parsonage, she witnessed a silver cigar-shaped UFO. And to Parsons, this was a sign that uh, she was the chosen one. She also had flaming red hair, uh, green eyes, so she fit perfectly the role of the Scarlet Woman. Later on, after uh, Parsons uh, died in the fiery demise, this is another connection to the early UFO contactees. Uh, Par uh, Marjorie Cameron Parsons ended up near Giant Rock, living in Pioneer Town, which is, I don't know, half a mile or so from Giant Rock. And I was amazed to hear this. She became uh, friends with George Van Tassel, and she was, during that period, was channeling or communicating with interdimensional beings as well. So, there's this thread or this continuance of these uh, contacts with uh, ritual magic and uh, UFOs over time. While Jack Parsons worked and actually did his science over at the JPL, uh, he came over to the Devil's Gate Dam uh, to do some of the Babylon working or at least investigate some of that uh, mystical, um, the mystical side of, of, of things in the occult. You think about science and, and uh, alchemy, you know, Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, who created calculus and created all of these things that scientists go on to use, uh, was an alchemist. And, um, you know, I think back then it was really hard to separate uh, what we would call hard science from squishy science. It's been separated now between, it, there's been a separation made between hard science and squishy science now in modern day that didn't exist previously with Sir Isaac Newton. I, I really think it's kind of interesting that these people, and it, it happens with some other, it happens with other scientists, that they're so focused on, on the science of things that they, they still are able to kind of put that aside, compartmentalize that and say, all right, I'm going to just think about not only science and how the world fits together on, on a uh, basis that I can prove and, and evaluate and measure, but also going to look into the world that's kind of immeasurable and unknowable. And I find that interesting. Uh, also, I'm, I'm I can't help but, as standing in front of the JPL, thinking about the, the letters JPL and think that Jack Parsons wanted to name it a little bit after him. He's got his initials in the JPL, Jack Parsons Laboratory, not just the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I feel as we're probably getting towards the halfway of the trip that we spent so much time in Los Angeles and that, that time was spent with a lot of people. It was great. We had a, some excellent uh, interviews and were able to go to a bunch of different places that were really interesting. But I feel like we're now on our way to the weird. I think we had, there were, there were things there that were interesting, but it was very people-based. I think we're now going to remote areas that are going to be um, filled with a different type of weird. Yeah, it does feel like we're, we're getting out to the unknown. It's interesting to note that the first trip we took sort of started out as the inverse of this trip. We ended up, we ended up, you know, uh, 
journeying out, uh, journeying out to uh, Las Vegas after Area 51 for Harold Camping's uh, apocalypse, May 21st, 2011. We started this trip with the September, September 28th uh, comet strike, and uh, now we're we're. Right out to Sierra Highway. Now it's all anticlimax from here, I guess. I don't think it's gonna be anticlimax. No, no, I think it's gonna be just different. Uh, we were surrounded by people. We were met uh, met a bunch of colleagues, and we had. Okay. We had more help in the beginning of a trip than we've ever had on any other trip we've, we've taken before. So that was nice and interesting, but it's, you can tell it's this, we're on the start of something else. So it begins. So it begins. So it re-begins. So it re-begins and re-begins. <laughs>